His pet deer symbolizes the simplicity of his upbringing. Under his father's watchful eye, this 11-year-old has little contact with the outside world. He spends his time studying, and here he chants verses from the Vedas, the Hindu scriptures, with his guru. According to the strictest tradition, he would emerge about his 25th year to marry and play his part in society. And later he would renounce worldly life and live as a holy man. But nothing is certain about his future, except that tomorrow's India, which has no need of Maharajas, will perhaps also demand more from him than the life of a holy man. He therefore has military training under his father's supervision, and he and the other palace children join the palace band before the last procession of the festival. In 1972, the Maharaja lost the privilege of being guarded by the state military. Toy soldiers with wooden rifles now guard the toy fort at Oramnagar. It is the 30th day of the festival, and the Maharaja mounts the elephant to ride in state to the festival ground, where, on each of the 30 days, there is an enactment of a scene from the great Hindu epic, which tells of the adventures of the legendary hero, Rama. Maharaja is accompanied by Rama and his consort Sita, who will take part in the play. Among the holy men who are gathered is a famous saint who swore a vow of silence 25 years ago. His humility impresses itself on the audience. Groups of singers chant verses from the epic and announce the arrival of the Maharaja. He approaches the stage to greet Rama and Sita, who are flanked by their supporters. As Rama garlands him, the commentator reminds the audience how Sita was stolen from Rama and taken to a far country by the demon king, Ravan. Rama and Sita thank the most popular character in the story, Hanuman, the king of the monkeys, who led his army of monkeys to defeat Ravan and bring Sita back to her lover. At the end of the festival, the Maharaja distributes arms to the holy men, for giving is an act which takes the devout Hindu nearer to godliness. But when he leaves the ceremony, he leaves a kind of vacuum. For although Ram Leela will surely continue, who can say whether the Maharaja will act as the central figure? At Bundi too, far off the track in romantic Rajasthan, the flag is flying for the last time. Here, within the walls of the ancient star fort, the old Hara kings first made themselves impregnable, and many are the legends that surrounded them, since times when forth from the sunlight the first of our kings came down and had the earth for his footstool and wore the stars for his crown. Here in medieval Bundi, you will find the most magnificent of the palaces of India, such a palace as men build in uneasy dreams, the work of goblins rather than of men. The Goblin Palace towers over the city of Bundi, which looks now exactly as it did when it was built in 1300. 
400 years ago, one of the Hara kings was deposed and exiled by his two scheming brothers. He died far from Bundi, but his teenage son returned to pay his respects to his wicked uncles. He was passed through the massive elephant gate by the old king's bodyguard, who was still loyal to him. At the gate, he passed the water clock, a copper bowl which sinks at the Hindu hour, and the keeper of the clock, whose only function is to strike the gong. Though the only ears to hear today are those of the ghosts of the wicked uncles. Beyond the gate, he climbed to where they sat in the great throne room, attended only by the guards, a regiment of whom had been brought from Afghanistan in 1600. Now only ten descendants of these ancient fighting men remain in Bundi. Their sole duty is to guard the long since empty throne, and it was before this same throne that the young man took his revenge. <coughs> Loyal followers, joined by the guards, slaughtered those who had backed the traitors. They carried their victims to the edge of the towering ramparts and threw them down to the cobblestones below. <coughs> High over the city, you will find the remains of an old garden. Who knows how many secret places such as this are to be found in the palace. All palaces in India, even the dead ones like Bundi, are full of eyes. In some, the idea of being watched is stronger than in others. In Bundi, it is overpowering. Beyond the garden lies an open room in which is painted the history of Bundi and priceless illustrations of the great epics of the Hindu faith. Humor and sensuality play their part in the old tales. Like the story of Lord Krishna, who stole the clothes of the milkmaids and hid them in a tree while they were swimming, tantalizingly out of reach. There are paintings of the Rajput princesses, renowned for their honour. And of the old kings of Bundi, the Haras, and their courtship of these beautiful maidens. Nowhere else in the world was there such a romantic sense of chivalry. The history of Bundi is a history of convenience. First the giant star fort. Then, as the strength of the Haras was proved, they moved down from their mountain top, and you could believe that nothing was impossible for the men that built the Goblin Palace. Later again, they moved to the foot of the gorge, to the Pearl Palace in the city. Finally, 70 years ago, the Maharaos of Bundi left their walled city and built the Lake Palace nearby, a dream of luxury and ease. It's been a long passage since the first of these kings came down, but if you travel to far off Bundi, you may be lucky enough to find the last of them. He is something of a hermit, as elusive as the tigers in the wildlife sanctuary whose preservation is the only thing he lives for. Modern India is finding her own solutions to the age-old problems of those who have and those who have not. And the sun has finally set for the Maharajas and for their way of life. But if you travel to India, you can at least see what used to be in this land whose children descended from the sun and learn for yourself the sweet sad stories of the death of kings.